every one of you here tonight. We're thankful to have all of our visitors, and uh, we're thankful to have our good sisters from over in the uh, Charleston area and being with us uh, for a few days here, hopefully the rest of the week. I don't know when you're going back home, but just everybody, we're, we're glad to have you. In, in preaching the gospel, you know, there's a lot of things that you could talk about, and oftentimes I'm accused of not getting too hard on things. Uh, and, and I guess it's just not my way. Some preachers can do that, and, and I just kind of simply preach the simple, plain gospel message. And this is my 50th year in preaching. Uh, and in those 50 years, I can count on my hands how many Sunday mornings I did not preach. So when you take 50 years times 52 weeks, that's 2,600 sermons. During that time, there's also the Sunday evening, so you add another 2,600 sermons because I've never missed preaching a Sunday night service. And then there's Wednesday night services that we had and do not have now at home, but we had at one time in, in, in my home in, in Lake Counts Mills and in Clearfield. And uh, so then you might add maybe half of that, I don't know. Then you have all the gospel meetings, so I've preached to quite a few sermons. One advantage, though, is that the sermon I preach at home, I get to preach here. So I get to preach some of those sermons two to three times. And maybe even I've had some that I've preached as high as 15 or 20 as I travel the country because I think they're worthy of, of the people knowing about them. Uh, but in doing so, after a while, you kind of run out of new ideas. You know, that I, I have no problem developing a sermon if I get an idea. But after a while, you seem to run out of new ideas. And really you don't because the Bible just has so many ideas and so many points. And certainly you can do the, the chapter study and verse study and all of that stuff. Uh, but uh, in, in, in this spring back home, I started a series. And I call that series Bible Greats. And I now have an endless material. Because there's a lot of Bible greats. There's a lot of people that we talk about from time to time. And that we use in our sermons. You know, we talk about Abraham and Noah. And we talk about... Uh, 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 maybe, uh, you know, uh, the Apostle Peter and Paul and James and John. And we talk about those individuals just in passing sometimes in, in our sermons, things that they said, things they wrote, things they did and so forth. And it's included in many of our sermons. And I thought, what would it be like if we just stopped for a minute and looked at those individuals in depth? Look at those individuals because there's a lot of information about them that we never do tell or never do reveal and so I, I started to do that. And uh, I, I go, I jump from the Old Testament to the New Testament, back and forth and so forth. As I said, there's an endless array of, of folks that God used. You know, it, it's a great credit to these people that these people found their names in the, in, in the great volume called the Bible. Were they special people? Were they born special? Were they, were they people who, uh, who, who had the different characteristics than you had? No. They're just normal, ordinary people. But God saw within them characteristics that he needed in his work. And so he chose those individuals. Why did he choose Abraham to be the father of many nations? You know, why, why did he, he, he choose, you know, any of the apostles or Jesus choosing any of the apostles? And, and tonight we're going to talk about actually one of those apostles, the one you know very well. His name is the Apostle Peter. Now, I, I, I'm not here just simply giving you a, I never knew what, how to refer to this, a, a, a biography. is a, An autobiography is one written by yourself, and it's so a biography. I'm not here giving you a biography of an individual only from the concept that I want to look at this person and to see why God used him, why, why God chose him. There is an example that every one of these characters, and I'll probably use this series the rest of the meeting, but there's a, a reason why we, we look at Peter and, and something that God needed him to represent to us. There are examples that are said, and you know, we follow examples. It may be the example of our parents or grandparents or the example of some preacher or somebody that we respect, and we follow their example. 
Well, these are individuals in the Bible that we use as examples. And that's how we use them because they, they did something and, and, uh, and God was pleased with it. And as a result of it, we would do well to follow that same example. And so that's how we will look at these gospel greats. And Peter certainly was one of them. And I refer to him as a champion of spiritual growth. And I think today one of the things that is very necessary in the church is growth. And if there's one thing that is lacking in the church today, it's growth. The Apostle Paul rebuked the brethren uh, that he wrote to in the book of Hebrews, if we include that he wrote that book, which I think he did. In the book of Hebrews, he rebuked those people. He said, for the time, ye ought to be teachers. But he says, you have me that one teach you again. They had not grown from the time that they had first heard the word and had not developed in any capacity, and he was rebuking them for that. Because he said, you ought to be teachers, but you still have someone that need to teach you. So have we grown? Think about this. I was here, I guess, last year. You know, this COVID thing messed me up as far as knowing where I went to and, and, and where it came. But I was here. Do you, have you grown from last year to this year? Can you truthfully say you have? Have you grown in biblical knowledge? Have you grown in service to the Lord? Have you grown in, in, in your, your desire to go to heaven and all of these things? That's an important question. And Peter represents what real growth was. Now, in order to understand this to a greater extent, in 2 Peter, the third chapter, that's our main verse, Paul, or Peter says, but grow in grace. But I want to lead you up to that verse because there's a, a lot of things. That's the last verse in the two books that Paul wrote, or I can say, that Peter wrote, First and Second Peter. That's the last verse in the letters that he wrote. He inspired the people, and he wanted them to grow in grace. All right. Well, let's find out why he made that statement in these letters that Peter wrote. He begins in chapter one of the first epistle, and he says, "I, Peter." An apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers. You see, these people whom Peter was writing to were not Jews in Jerusalem, although they might have got the letter. As you know, eventually everybody got the letter. We got the letter. But Peter's actually writing to a group of people who had left the Jerusalem area and Judea and had gone north up into, you know, uh, many, many places, uh, up into Asia, and, and many of the churches, I suppose, that were started around Asia, uh, mine are there, and the seven churches of Asia may have been some of those individuals that left Jerusalem. Why did they leave Jerusalem? They left Jerusalem because of persecution. They were being persecuted by the Jews, as well as being persecuted by the Romans. But, you know, they went into the Roman world, so that didn't change anything. But I suppose they thought, if I can get out of here and I can go to Antioch, that was one of the major uh, hubs, you know, that, that was one of the early churches at Antioch. That was up there in a foreign land. If I can just get to Antioch, I I'll be better off. Kind of like, you know, keeping with the theme last night, kind of like the Americans when they came to this country. They came because of persecution in their own country. They, 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 they got on those boats, the Mayflower and all those, you know, boats that weren't worthy, I suppose, of traveling the sea. And they left everything behind to come to this country so that they could find what? Basically, religious freedom. That's why they came. So these people did the same thing. So they, they, they left. And so Peter says, I write unto you, he says, as strangers, and he even mentions the places. Throw Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he's writing to all of these Christians that have settled down in these foreign lands. He calls them strangers. Why are they strangers? They weren't strangers to him. They were not strangers to God. They were strangers in a strange country. Because these folks jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. I know you know that expression. They jumped out of the frying pan into the fire because they left a place where they were being persecuted by Jews and went to a place that was godless. They went to a place that was filled with paganism and heathenism. So now they've got, you know, they've got a whole new set of problems to face. 
And, 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 and what Peter recognized here was, and the reason he wrote this letter, these letters, if you, if you read this with this in mind, you will see it very quickly. Peter wrote these letters because these people were getting discouraged. They were getting discouraged. You know, we, we, we've done everything we can and we're still persecuted and we're still having trouble, you know, trying to live our life as a, as a Christian or, or perhaps as, as they believe that the word dictated onto them. And so Peter writes his letter to people who were discouraged to build them up. It's a great building up uh, message. If you ever want to build up, you just read First and Second Peter. If you ever get discouraged, just read First and Second Peter because that's what Peter does. And he says here, he says, elect, he calls them the elect, according to the foreknowledge of the God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And, and he goes on to remind them of this inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, that faith is not away and is reserved in heaven for you. We can't ever lose sight of that promise. And that's what he does in the very first few verses of this chapter. He goes on in 1 Peter, and he talks about specific things, how that they should live in the country in which they are live, being respectful to the leaders and the rulers of that country, how that they should deal with enemies, how that they should deal with people who, 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 who test their faith and so forth. He addresses all of that. And he goes on in, and he, he writes another letter then following this one here, 2 Peter. In 2 Peter, he starts out by talking about adding to your faith. He says, he says you have a faith, but he says you need to add to that faith. And, and you add to your faith virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and all of those things. And he continues on to encourage them. And then he finally comes down to the last few verses of 2 Peter. He says, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. He wants them to know that God is long-suffering towards them. Even as our beloved brother Paul, he gives respect to this comrade of his, to this individual who helps to preach the gospel. He says, our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to be understood, which when they are on learned and on stable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, listen to this carefully now, ye therefore, Beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. He's summing it up pretty quick here. He says, just beware, because you can be led away. And that's why he's writing. He doesn't want them to be led away. He wants them to stand strong. And then he says, but grow. In other words, folks, you can't you can't stay where you're at. You can't you can't just kind of you know quit working and you can't quit growing. You've got to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And so that's why this verse is so very important. That's what he closes with after this great uh, writing and this great book of instruction and encouragement that he gives them to hold on. But you can't stay where you are. You have to move onward. You have to, you have to move forward. And, and, uh, and, and I, I say to each and every one of us here tonight, we've got to do that. We've got to grow. If, if we're the same today as we were two years ago, something's wrong. Because I tell you what happens. If you think you've grown fully and that you have, you have reached the peak, you're kind of like that fruit on the tree that is ripe. There's only one other direction for it to go, and that is to go rotten. And you don't want to go rotten, but a lot of people have gone rotten, haven't they? They've gone rotten because they feel like I've reached the pinnacle, I've, I've, I've reached the top, I've, I've done everything I can do, or I've got all the knowledge that I can gain. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need fellowship anymore. No, that, that doesn't work that way, because then you only go downhill from there. So there's always room for growth in each and every one of us. Growth. Peter was one who spiritually grew, and it was obviously very important to him because, as I said, he closes this very book with it, and he addresses it as well throughout the two books that he writes there. It was a topic with which he could closely identify with because I know of no other person, and I, and I say this sincerely to you, I know of no other person that grew more than Peter grew. The man that you know as the Apostle Peter 
The man that preached the very first gospel sermon in the book of Acts, the second chapter, the man who wrote those two books that I talked about here just a little bit ago, first and second Peter, was nothing like the man that was introduced to Jesus Christ near the Sea of Galilee. He was nothing. He had grown tremendously. So he knew all about growing. And he is a perfect example to talk about growth. The life of Peter stands out as an example of the transforming power of the gospel of Christ. You know, last night we mentioned a verse, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's exactly what the Bible will do. The truth will set you free. The truth will, will give you new insight, and it will cause you or enable you to grow. The man who responded, and I mentioned this already, to the call of Jesus by the Sea of Galilee was nothing like the apostle who stood there in Acts, the second chapter. Peter was the most human of the twelve of the apostles. He is the most human because he's just like all of us. But yet God realized that he was a, 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 a piece of a diamond in the rough with great polishing possibilities. There are great lessons, I think, to be learned from a study of the apostle Peter, where we are told more about him than we are any of the other apostles, with the exception of the Apostle Paul. But I'm talking about the 12 that were chosen by Jesus. We know more about him, and we hear more from him than we do any of the other. And also, we can identify him because the Bible tells us about him with all of his flaws, with all of his weaknesses. And so we relate to those things, and sometimes we find ourselves doing the very same thing that Peter might have done. So let's look at Peter during the ministry of Jesus. When he was first chosen and so forth, let's see what kind of a character that he was. His life before meeting Jesus was this. His name was Simon. It was not Peter or Cephas, which is, of course, equivalent. Peter and Cephas are used interchangeably here. But his name was Simon or Simeon. In the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, verse 14, Simeon, he was what he was addressed there, had declared how God of the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Peter was born in the city of Bethsaida, a village just north of the Sea of Galilee. Now, why does Bethsaida remind you? Or why is it, why is it a name that you often many times have heard? Or, or at least it's been taught in sermons and so forth. What is there about the city of Bethsaida? I want you to know about the city of Bethsaida where Peter was born. Jesus tells you about this city. Matthew eleven twenty one. 21. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. It wasn't a very likable place as far as Christianity was concerned and the promotion of Christianity. Jesus pronounced woe upon the city upon which Peter was born in. And he says, because for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Jesus spent 18 months of his three years in this vicinity around the Sea of Galilee and all the towns and the little villages that were there. He spent most of his time in Bethsaida and in and, and, uh, Capernaum and other cities around this place. Jesus performed most of his miracles in this part of the country and taught most of his parables in this part of the country. And so that's why Jesus was saying, if the things had been done in Tyre and on, which I, I, I did in your city, they would have repented long ago. Tyre and on, the wickedest cities known. He said they had repented a long time ago. That's how these people were. They rejected the counsel of God. They rejected Jesus and his words and his miracles and, and the parables that he spoke. That's where Peter was born. Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. We're introduced to another man here, Andrew. Andrew was the brother of Peter. In fact, had it not been for Andrew, we wouldn't have known the Apostle Peter, I suppose, because Andrew was one of the first converts. He was one of the ones that went out and told Peter about Jesus. And so we're thankful for Andrew. You know, in, in Christianity, that also is so very important. There are those who are responsible for the conversion of others, but they kind of sit back in the shadows. They're not, they're not known or, or they're not recognized or whatever. Perhaps that person who's converted goes on to become a great person, but had it not been for that one individual. Andrew, of course, has a reputation in the Bible. 
on three different occasions, Andrew is always bringing something to Christ. The people that came and, 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 and came to the apostles, they said, we would see Jesus. Andrew says, come on, I'll take you to me. And then it was Andrew, whenever he had the great multitude, the four or five thousand, whatever it was there, that he was going to feed, you know, with the fish and the barley loaves. It was Andrew that brought the little boy to Jesus and, uh, and, and uh, said, Lord, this boy has, you know, a couple of fishes, a couple of barley loaves, but, you know, there's not much you can do with that, but at least he brought that boy to Jesus. It was Andrew in the third place that brought Peter to Jesus. And you know, for that reason, I think I've mentioned this to you before, for that reason, Hollywood picked up on that. I'm surprised that they did, that they even thought about the Bible in this respect, because every TV show that you will, will remember, or a, a, a movie that has an angel in it, especially a death angel, you know, they talk about the death angel. I don't believe in such, but, but, but you know, they, they have this, this death angel. His name will always be Andrew. The next time you watch one of those flicks, you just, you just take notice of it. His name will always be Andrew because they know that Andrew is always bringing people to Jesus. And so they think that when a person dies, the angel Andrew comes and gets you and takes you to the Lord. Well, that's Hollywood for you. But, but you know, Andrew is a very important individual here. He is the brother of Peter. I put a little map here because I kind of like to see what I'm talking about whenever I'm studying. And I want you to see where Bethsaida is in relation to all the other areas. Bethsaida is right up here. It's just north of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, it's almost on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. Many of these names you will recognize. Bethsaida, Capernaum. Jesus spent time in Capernaum. There is, of course, Magdala. You know, Magdala was a, a city that was, uh, was kind of on the coast there of the Sea of Galilee. You heard of a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene, most people think Magdalene was her last name. It was not her last name. We don't know what her last name is. Mary from Magdala is who she was. Mary Magdalene. It's kind of like, you know, the Inezians. You know, if you're from Inez, you're an Isaac, Inezian or, 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 or whatever. You know, it, it, it typifies who you were. They would use this little phrase, anybody from, from Magdala was a Magdalene. So you, you see how that worked. And so Mary was from Magdala. Uh, in, this, in this little place, well, let me go back here. Uh, went too far. Push the wrong button again. You know, Cana, you heard the story of Cana of Galilee. Cana of Galilee is where Jesus performed his very first miracle, turning the water into wine. Now here you have the city of Nazareth. That's where Jesus was raised as a child. And it was here that Nazareth wasn't a very nice place because of the fact that, that, you know, there was this one in the Bible that says when he was told that come and see Jesus of Nazareth, he said, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? No, because it was kind of like New York City and Chicago. <laughs> I, I don't know, we don't have any New Yorkians here, but, uh, you know, nothing good come out of that place because it was just recognized that the philosophy of it was a, a terrible place. Here you got the little city of Nain. Remember, Jesus went into Nain one day, and there was a, a funeral procession coming out, the widow of Nain. And she had lost her only child, and her husband, she was a widow, so she didn't have a man, she didn't have her son to take care of her. And Jesus had compassion on her, raised that boy back to life again, the widow of Nain. There is Gadara over here. Remember, there was a, a fellow here that Jesus cast out demons from. Uh, and, and just all on Tiberius was a city that was built by one of the Roman rulers and so forth. Uh, and in Chorizon, these are the two cities that Jesus put woe on, Chorizon and Bethsaida. Now, these cities, as you look at this map, these cities weren't very far away. In fact, probably to get from Capernaum to Bethsaida would be like going from here to downtown Linus. Okay? You've got to put this in perspective. Jesus was dealing with areas, this, the Sea of Galilee is only about 12 miles long, so, you know, from Bethsaida, clear down here to Philateria, was only about 12 miles. I imagine a little further going around the curves and whatever, but, but by the way that the, the crow flies, as they say, it wasn't very far. 
So these cities were all kind of all together. And Jesus worked daily within them. And he spent, as I said, 18 months in this particular area right here. So I just wanted to show you the area that we're talking about. Let me give you a couple of pictures as well. Uh, along with his father and his brother, Peter was a fisherman at Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. In Mark, Matthew 4, and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway left their nets and followed him. Have you ever wondered about that verse? A stranger comes up to you, and you're fishing. Ronnie, you go fishing. If someone come up there in New York and said, Ronnie, I want you to follow me. You going to pack up your fishing tackle and go after him? Probably not. Says something about Peter, though, about his, his impulsiveness. I mean, he just jumped at the chance to do anything without even giving it any thought. He just up, dropped the fishing nets that he had, and followed Jesus. That was a remarkable thing about him, but it put him in in danger many, many times to have that impulsiveness to do something without thinking about it. It was a little dangerous to him later on. He recited at Capernaum as did his wife's mother. So Peter was married. He, his, his wife's mother lived with him in Capernaum. In Matthew 8, and when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid in sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. So Jesus had performed a great miracle for Peter's mother-in-law. Now, I want you to notice this picture here. This right here is the synagogue at Capernaum. It's what's left of the synagogue at Capernaum. Uh, the synagogue at Capernaum is where Jesus would have, in those 18 months, would have gone in order to, you know, praise God or, or to uh, participate in religious services. Jesus would have attended this particular synagogue. A synagogue was that which you had to have ten families to be able to have. The synagogues were started when the children of Israel had been taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar over into Babylon. They no longer had a temple to worship in, and so they were permitted to establish what was called a synagogue. The word synagogue simply means a meeting place. In the synagogue, there were certain things that, that it was, a, it was a, you know, like we have things that we do in our worship, sing, pray, and teach, and so forth. In the synagogue, they would start out with, of course, the praising of God. And then there would be a reading, two readings, actually. There would be a reading of the law, and there would be a reading of the prophets. And the Bible refers to this, the law and the prophets. The Old Testament was divided up that way. The law was the first five books of your Old Testament. The prophets was Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you know, Daniel, all of those individuals. So, so whatever writings they had of those, a man would be selected in this synagogue, and he would get up and he would read. They chose Jesus to read from the prophets. So Jesus gets up, and he reads from the prophets. And it's a... It's a, a prophecy about himself. Luke 4, I think, is where this is found. It's a prophecy about himself. And he says, this day are these words fulfilled in, in your eyes. Well, that made them mad. That made them mad that he would tell them, I'm the one that this prophecy is actually talking about. And they got so angry, the Bible says, they took him out and put him up on a high hill and was going to throw him over that's what they were going to do with him. They, they took him up there. And you know, you, you, you see people performing magic, and most of that is just the sleight of eye. Jesus, it says, escaped through the midst of them. I think he vanished, don't you? I think he vanished. I think the greatest magical trick was performed right there. It says he, he escaped through the midst of them. They had him, you know, hand and, and, and were holding him, but somehow he got loose. I don't think there was any fighting going on. He just, he's gone. And so, you know, this was the synagogue where Jesus was doing this thing right here. Now, you'll notice that here are some foundations all around. And the synagogue was kind of like the center of the town. So this would have been the center of Capernaum and all of these little uh, foundations. This right here is kind of unusual, isn't it? It's kind of like a technicon thing. I don't know how they know that, but they said that was Peter's house. 
That's what they say. I mean, all the all the people who have uncovered these things and so forth over there, they say that this is Peter's house. Notice how close it is to the uh, to to the synagogue. It says something about Peter. He wanted to get close to the place where he could worship his God. Uh, it, it you know it, it also it was altogether different than all the other foundations. It may, it may suggest that either Peter or his mother was a fairly well-to-do person because they had quite a large house. And so this is where Peter would have lived in Capernaum. You'll notice alongside of this, uh, of this synagogue, there is a roadway. This was the old Roman road that went north and south. The Romans were great about building roads because they wanted to get from one place to another. And, you know, in the sand and the dust and the desert, it's difficult, of course, to, to, to traverse if you've got, uh, you know, these horses and, and, and buggies with chariots and steel wires, steel wheels or wind wheels, whatever they had. It was difficult. So the Romans were well known for the building of their roads to be able to conquer any nation that they wanted. That was the Roman road that went past Capernaum down around, of course, the Sea of Galilee, all the way down to Jerusalem. That would have been the road. The Roman army would have marched right alongside of this in AD 70 when they went to Jerusalem to capture it. The whole Roman army. I'm sure Peter, I don't know, in AD 70, I guess he was still around by then. I don't know, he'd been an old man if he was, but, but he might have witnessed some of those things. All right, here's what the picture of the synagogue would have actually looked like. Here is a picture of what it looks like today. Now, this is not a picture out of the book. This is out of my camera. I had the opportunity to go there many years ago, and I stood there in the floor of the, uh, uh, of the synagogue, and I took this picture, and this is what is left of the back wall. This is what's left of the front wall. And, of course, these are the two doors that they would go into the synagogue. And, uh, and, and, and as I said, it, it, was, it, was, it was a privilege to me to be able to stand there be able to take those pictures. This is that Roman road that was, that was made with rocks, you know, in a, in a country that's filled with sand and dust. So they would make these roads that would, that would stand the test of time. And this road, as it is right there, is now over 2,000 years old. And many a Roman horseman and Roman chariots would have traveled down that road. All right. Here's the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, this little village that we've showed you now that is this kind of an excavation site. It is right north of this Sea of Galilee, a body of water about 12 miles long, maybe five, six miles wide, not very big. I just threw this picture in. I was a lot younger back then. <laughs> Brother David Fowler was with us, and myself, Brother Paul Collins, and of course, uh, James Trailer. And, and this is the Sea of Galilee. And, and we're on a boat here, the Sea of Galilee. And, and that's the boat, the kind of boat that Jesus would have been on. That's the kind of boat that Peter and Andrew would have been using to fish in that water. You'll notice that water, the day we were there, that water was just a steel, just like a mere glass. Just like a mere glass. And you wonder how that in the Bible, when they were on the Sea of Galilee, the storm came up. And that the waves became so boisterous that it would actually capsize that boat or go over that boat. And the apostles were in that boat one time, and Jesus was in the hinder part, which was, uh, you know, you might think that that means the, the, the behind part, but it was up in here is where you crawl back in. There was no bottom to the boat. You just crawl back in, and Jesus was sleeping. And they said, Lord or Master, do you, don't you care that we're perishing? So Jesus gets up, and he steals the water. And I'm thinking it probably looked like that immediately after the storm and the waves were rolling over the boat. The call of Peter. Okay, that's his. That's all we know about his, his early life. But the call of Peter comes on board. His brother Andrew brought him to Jesus, who gave him the surname Cephas. His name was Simon, but his name was changed. A lot of people's names were changed in the Bible to describe who they would be. Abram was changed to Abraham, you remember, because he would be the father of many nations. Uh, there are several others in the Bible whose names were changed. Of course, Paul had two names. You know, he was Paul, but he had a, a Jewish name that was Saul. As Paul was his wrong name. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him, that's John the Baptist now, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finds his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted to Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus began, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, 
Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So Peter, or Cephas, means a stone or the rock, a rock. When Jesus said that, they had to all laugh. Because Peter was nothing like a rock. He was so impulsive. He would jump from one thing to another. There was nothing solid about the life of Peter. And so that's why I put in here how ironic it is that Jesus gave, gave the name Peter or Cephas uh, and called the rock to Simon. How strange they must have seemed that those who knew him. Perhaps they recoiled in laughter when they heard this new name. It would be the same as calling a bald man Curly. <laughs> <laughs> or, or calling a, a fat man skinny. That's kind of the way it was to call Peter a rock. And, and so it just didn't fit. But you see, Jesus, and, and, and we have to appreciate that Jesus could see what Peter would become because he would grow. He would grow. Grow into something that the Lord wanted him to be. Brother Bob Johnson used to say, he said, he said, if we'd have been in the position of choosing any of the apostles, we would have chosen a one of them. We really wouldn't have. Why would you choose James and John? They got a temper that just won't stop. They're called the son of Bernerges. And, and, and why would you choose Simon Zealotes? That wasn't his last name. A zealot was a terrorist. He was a terrorist, a Jew who was a terrorist, and every chance he got, he would bomb the Romans. Well, of course, he didn't have bombs, I guess, but he, he was involved in all those terrorist groups against the Roman authority. Why would you choose him? Why would you pick Matthew, a tax collector, who doesn't have a chance to begin with because he has no respect? Why would you pick him? Why would you pick Judas Iscariot when you knew he was going to turn against you? So you wonder why Jesus chose them, and he did, because he knew what they would be, and he knew what they would turn out Hearkening to the call of Jesus, he became his constant companion. He became one of the apostles. When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against all unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter. Was he the first? No, he was not the first. Andrew was one of the first. And there were others even that preceded Peter. But in every list that you find in the Bible of the list of the apostles, Peter is always number one. Peter's always number one. Peter's earnestness and his courage made him a leader among the disciples. His name appears first in all the list of the apostles. And he, along with James and John, was a part of that special group of three. There were several times that Jesus would take his apostles into a certain area, and then he would leave them at that point, and he took with him three men, Peter, James, and John, and they'd go a little further, especially the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he took them a little further. Another place that he took them was on, you know, the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, the Mount of Transfiguration, I don't know why he only took those three, but he took Peter, James, and John up there to the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus shone brilliant, you know, as the sun. And, and, and Peter, James, and John saw Jesus talking to two former great men, Moses and Elijah, remember. He's talking to them. So Jesus, and, and this is what now is on the top of that Mount of Transfiguration. This is on the top of the mountain looking down. Again, this is a picture that I took when I was there. But looking down, a beautiful sight that Jesus saw looking down from that. And so Peter had the great privilege of, of being there. And when Jesus came, he's just over there a little ways talking with Moses and Elijah. When he came back, Peter impulsively, without even thinking what he was saying, said, Lord, it's been good for us to be here. Let's build here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. It was then the windows of heaven opened up and the voice of God spoke plainly. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And they walked down off of that mountain. But Peter spoke before he even gave thought to what he was saying. That's the kind of man that he was. You know, we talked about President Trump 
We talk about how he, and, and I'm not here again being political, but we all know how he just said what he was on his, on his mind. Peter would have been an equal to President Trump. Really? Because he said what was on his mind. That was on his mind. It didn't make a difference if it was the Lord standing there. That's what he said. What's tragic about that is the Roman Catholic Church came in and built three tabernacles. <laughs> That's what's there now. Three tabernacles. You go in here, the center in the middle is the crucifix up there. It's a beautiful structure. But it's you go in and that's where you would worship Jesus. You go over here to this side, and there's a big statue of Moses there. And you go over this side, there's a big statue of Elijah. They did the very thing that God actually said not to do. But uh, that's, again, the way the religious world is. So, you know, in another place that, that, that Peter, James, and John went to uh, is they, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, uh, and this is where that is. Of course, this is the temple here. And there's the east gate here. You can look across from the temple and you see the Garden of Gethsemane on the other side. There's a what's called the Kadron Valley that goes down and, and between the two. So you kind of dip down, but it's not like the mountains. Don't, don't get, get, get away from here. It's not like the mountains of, uh, of Inez, Kentucky. But it's a hill, I guess, what we would call a hill. So Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane quite often. It was there that he prayed so fervently that, uh, you know, drops fell from his head, as it were, great drops of blood and, and uh, of, of sweating and so forth. And, and, and uh, you know, he was praying, Father, if this cup may pass from me, let it be pass. But if, if not, if your will be done, thy will, will be done. And so this is where, of course, Peter, James, and John went to. This is looking from the Garden of Gethsemane back to the temple. This is the temple area right here. And so you see it's not a very big hill, but this is where Peter, James, and John would have been sitting under some olive tree, I suppose. This is looking from the temple now back out to the Garden of Gethsemane. This they built a structure right there in the middle of it. But up on top here is the Mount of Olives, and that's exactly where Jesus ascended one day to heaven. And he left there after telling the disciples, go into the world and preach the gospel. That's the place he left this earth. So the Garden of Gethsemane was very important, and it was important to Jesus to have Peter with him there. Peter was not anything like the other eleven. He was impulsive, often acting impetuously before giving thought to what he was doing or was saying. Seeing Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee one day, you remember, he, he, he recognized it was Jesus. He said, let me come on to you. And Jesus says, come on. What's Peter do? <laughs> he jumps out of the boat, starts walking. And then his faith left him. I believe he actually walked, but his faith left him. He didn't think about it, I guess, how serious this was. And he began to sink, and he had to cry unto the Lord to save him. But that was Peter. At the transfiguration, he spoke up when he should have been listening. He spoke up when he should have been thinking and watching what was going on. In the upper room, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, you remember what Peter said, you're not going to wash mine. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. Peter says, wash everything. <laughs> but that was Peter. You're not going to wash mine. But, you know, he, he didn't understand what Jesus was doing. And in fact, he was teaching a great lesson here of humility. It was Peter when Jesus was arrested there in the garden of Gethsemane. He took the sword off of one of the soldiers and cut off one of the ears. I mean, he didn't even think about it. He just took that sword and whacked off the ear went. And Jesus, of course, was able to put it back on. He affirmed his loyalty to Jesus so strongly that he said, Though all men be offended because of me, I will never be offended. And then just a couple of hours later, he denies the Lord. Curses and swears and says he knows not the man. That was Peter. He spoke. Because, you know, at the moment, I'll not be offended by you at all. At the moment, I mean, it seemed the right thing to say. But when he was put to the test, he wasn't able to follow through with it. Uh, and when Jesus, though, saw some potential in this individual, even though Peter was impetuous, uh, Jesus was patient with him. Even when Simon was cowardly, Christ could see easily through him that he would become the individual. It's interesting that it was to Peter that he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Peter's low point as a disciple was his denial of Jesus. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, people have to hit bottom, don't they? And I think Peter hit bottom here. And when you get to the bottom, there's only one place to go, and that's back up again. And so Peter grew. He grew from that moment. He had been with Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry. 
He had expressed great confidence in him. I will never deny you. He had said he was willing to die for and with Jesus. He had defended Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He even fled with all the other disciples, but he did have enough stamina to follow afar off with Jesus to where Jesus would be put on trial. So he followed afar off. He denied the Son of God there in that courtyard. He and John had gone to the court of the high priest. He denied Jesus three times. The Lord looked upon him, and when he did, he remembered the words that Jesus had spoken unto him, You will deny me thrice. At that moment, the Bible says, he went out and wept bitterly. That was bottom for him. His, his self-centeredness seemed to go away then. I would have liked to have seen that look, wouldn't you? The Bible says they saw each other and their eyes met. That Jesus saw Peter over there. Peter saw Jesus. You think, can you imagine how big he felt? How small he felt, perhaps, is what I want to say. Why did he deny the Lord? It's because of his self-confidence. When we get to thinking that we're so good that we can't fall, the Bible says take heed. Take heed, lest you fall. Take heed, those of you who sing, lest you fall. He became an easy victim for Satan. Jesus knew it. He said, Satan desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter knew that he would be converted. He follows Jesus from afar off. Again, that's something that we have to recognize here. You can't follow Jesus afar off. You've got to be right by his side. Don't, don't get behind him so far that you're not recognized as being with Jesus. But that's what Peter did. He followed afar off. This event changed his life. Peter, after the death, the burial, and the resurrection, things began to change. Peter was a changed man after the resurrection, no longer unstable, no longer impetuous. He became a dedicated servant of the Lord who boldly laid his life on the line. Examples of Peter's transformation. On the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts, the second chapter, he preached the very first gospel sermon ever preached. And there were 3,000 souls that responded to that message that was preached by the Apostle Peter. He rebuked the hypocrisy and the lies of Ananias and Sapphira. He went with John to Samaria to investigate reports that some Samaritans had accepted the gospel. And while there, he rebuked Simon the sorcerer for wishing to purchase the gift of God with money. He was doing his bidding the things that God wanted him to do. He preached to the very first Gentile convert. There in the book of Acts, the 10th chapter, Cornelius, he preached to that convert and converted him to Christianity. And he knew while he did that, he knew that his brethren would be upset with him because they had never accepted a Gentile into the church up until that time. He was imprisoned by King Herod Agrippa, but was miraculously released. He took a leading part in the discussion on circumcision, which was one of the dividing issues of the early church. Peter took a part in that when Paul and Barnabas came to Jerusalem to talk about it. Tradition says that Peter was crucified on a cross, but he chose to be crucified upside down because he did not want to be equal to his Lord in death. That is as far as being crucified like our Lord. And so, you know... Again, this is a summary of some of the things that Peter did. I know I've gone a little over, but here's the formula for Peter's growth. And if you will put this into practice, I can guarantee you tonight that you will grow also. I think he's a prime example of growth, don't you? I mean, he went from nothing to becoming one of the greatest apostles of all time. One of the most important individuals, as Jesus said to Peter, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth, I will bind in heaven. Whatsoever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And Peter used those keys in the day of Pentecost to preach to the Jews. And then in Acts the 10th chapter, he used those keys to preach to Cornelius. And the household of God that is open to all mankind. Peter had that great responsibility to do that. Peter said to his brethren, and besides this, Previously to that passage, previously to verse 5, he said, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that we might be able to become partakers of the divine nature. So everything, God has done everything, that we can become partakers with him in the divine nature, in heavenly things, spiritual things. But Peter says, wait a minute. That's not enough. 
Oh, people say, that's enough. As long as God's done his part and he shed his grace on me and he shed his mercy on me, that's all we need. No, Peter says there's something else. He said, beside this, you see, there's God's part and then there's my part. And besides this, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Then look what he says. He says, for if these things be in you and abound, that's growing, something that is moving onward, abounding, if it abounds, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, but he that lacketh these things is blind, he cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did Peter know what he was talking about? When he talked about growing, he knew what it took to grow. And so he's our example of that capacity. So there's what you, if you, you I give you any uh, homework assignment tonight, there's where you need to spend your time right there, looking up and finding out what those things are. Knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, because they will help you to grow into the fullness of what God wants you to be. We never know the minds of those that are present here tonight. If you have grown tonight to a point that you recognize you need to become a Christian, we would be willing to uh, be a part of that, and, and we ask you to be baptized, to confess the name of Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, repent of your sins, and and uh, become a Christian this evening. Or if you're here, you, you've already been a Christian, but you've strayed away and you would desire to return. We bid you come while we stand, while we sing the selected hymn. Number 593.